Hey, Pastor Edward Ondachi. My name is Pastor Angie. This is Pastor Victor Mudembo. Pastor Milton Jumba. Hey, yo, Kevin Kilonzi. Reverend Cheche. Toki this right here. This is Kevin Doria. This is Pastor Njoro. This is Pastor Godwin Mutai. The welcome of Una South. Wagwan Brooklyn. Mambo VP Swahili Campus from downtown. Crossroads, I hope you're there. Mavuno Hill City. Hey, Connect. Mashariki. Welcome. So glad you could join us this morning. Your campus pastor, Yuko Hapa. Adwadeka. What's up, Mavuno Lifeway? Tuko locked. So glad to have you. I hope you're watching. You know what it is. Come on now. Ngumi bado ngapi? Mbuegze. Come on, man. Karibu, karibu sana to Mavuno Church. We are indeed happy and delighted to be together with you today, wherever you're watching us from. How are you? Great, great, great. Now this morning we just want to start off with the word of the Lord in Matthew 5.16 that says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now with that today, we are privileged, we are so honored to be joined by a light of the world. Somebody say amen. amen. We are being joined by a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Somebody say amen. amen. Now you've seen her on your screens. You've been blessed by her music and her ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome the wonderful, the amazing, the beautiful, Laura Carrera. Good morning, everybody. I'm so blessed to be here. And in the spirit of letting our lights shine, I got to do this song with Alice Kimanzi that says, Manze, in everything we do, ajulikane. Um, at the end of the day, our lives should reflect him and our lives should bring glory to him. Are you ready? Yep, yep, yep. yep. <laughs> All right, let's go.
prayer of our hearts this morning is that the glory of the Lord will shine, that the Lord attend the Lea Kujulikana. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Now the word of the Lord also says in Psalm 136, 1, that we should give thanks to the Lord for He is good and His love endures forever. Now why do I say this? I don't know if you guys remember eh, some time back, some years back in high school. Eh? Do you remember the prison worship songs of that time? Do you guys remember the songs of those days? We remember. Eh? We remember. <laughs> especially Laura and I, Tulukwa Shule Moja Pale, Tulukwa Tuna Lead Prison Worship with little or no instruments at all. <laughs> yeah. So we just want to do a little throwback today. You know, take us back to those songs that we used to sing Kitambo. They used to shika men. But the most important thing is that the Lord remains the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So even as we sing these familiar songs, these throwback songs, please, wherever you're watching from, engage with us, sing, feel free to dance, and praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Father, 
Hallelujah. 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 Indeed, God is good. I hope just had a fun time of remembering these songs you used to sing some time back in the day. Longer for others, shorter for others. But the, the thing that remains is that the Lord is good through the ages. Amen. Amen. So right now we just want to settle into the next part of our set. And this morning, we are blessed by the fact that we serve the God of creation. Now many times we, sometimes we visit places or even in the places where we are. Sometimes you wake up in the morning, you, you get out, you look at the sunrise and you're just like, man. There's someone who created this. There's someone who crafted this and thought this through. So even as we get into this part of, of the worship, I pray that your hearts will long for this God who is so majestic that he can think so meticulously through all aspects of creation. And just imagine how much more does he love you? How much more is he concerned with the things of your life? We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. There is none like you and that is what we want to acknowledge today.
you for your love unto us, O oh God. We are a God who certainly deserves all our praise, all our worship, all our honor. And we trust you, O oh God, to heal our hearts where they're aching. We trust you, O oh God, to heal our land. We trust you, O oh Lord, to heal this world. We praise you and worship you.
My name is Angela Kimara. I'm one of the pastors here at Mavuno. I'm so excited about the Be The Spark Challenge. Guys, we are going to go through a wonderful experience of walking with someone. It's an opportunity to walk with someone and spur on someone's faith. Uh, I was having a conversation with my daughter this week. We were taking a walk and my daughter turned to me all of a sudden and said, Mom, why doesn't God kick Corona? Because to her, Corona is a guy who just walks around the neighborhood and is, you know, preventing, you know, her moving forward in her life. Um, and I realized we just come from the supermarket. She couldn't enter the supermarket. She doesn't go to school. There's limited amount of interaction that she's having in this season and she just doesn't get it. It got me thinking about my friends and my colleagues who are also battling what life looks like for them in this uh, season, trying to figure out their careers and what it means for them in business. People are trying to figure out how to do family, how to engage in this season. There's so much going on. Well, people, I want us to, to invite you to, to have an opportunity to do life and spur someone's faith on, to discuss what meaning and purpose looks like in this season. And we're going to do this through this Be The Spark Challenge. Let me tell you how the Be The Spark Challenge works. I'm going to share with you three S's. The first S is search. Search and identify three to six people that you can work with in this season. This could be your family, or it could be nieces and nephews, it could be colleagues at work, it could be peers in a, in a sector that you love to work in. I want you to identify them and, and invite them to do this journey with you in the next season. The second S is sign up. So I wanna invite you to sign up. Go onto our website, which is provided below me, and sign up for this experience. Perhaps you are, you've been joining our community online and you wanna participate more, sign up and join community. Perhaps uh, you've been in Mavuno for a while. I wanna invite you to lead and move to the next level. So I'm excited because we're actually going to be using one of the tools that we've had for 15 years, which is Mizizi. This is our greatest tool to begin a journey with someone or to discuss meaning and purpose in our lives. And so this uh, version of, of Mizizi is revamped, you guys. We're gonna have weekly devotions devotions from our senior pastor, Pastor Muredi Wanjao. We're going to have weekly facilitation guides and tools that are available to you online. We're going to have an e-version of Mizizi. I'm just excited. We have a new week that has been added to the, to the Mizizi a book. And so I'm excited about what God is going to do. So I want to invite you to sign up. You don't want to miss out. The third S is start. We're starting on the 6th of September, so that means we only have a couple of weeks to identify our people, a couple of weeks for you to get yourself familiarized with the resources. But you guys, it's gonna be an amazing experience. Be the spark. Yeah. 
Hello, and my name is Pauline Jiao, and I want to take you through my Be The Spark story. After becoming a believer, I really lived for myself. I'll be honest. I was too busy. I had children, I had a business, I was running around. And I really felt that the business of leading people to Christ and making disciples was really the responsibility of the pastor. And I outsourced that responsibility. And occasionally I, I did the usual. I went to church on Sunday, I gave my tithes and offer. You know, I was a good Christian. Until I began to read the word of God and I began to understand that the biggest calling of a believer is to actually go out and teach people how to live like Jesus Christ. And I began to wonder whether that is what I was doing. And to be honest, I began to become very fidgety. I began to worry about it. And I began to have small panic moments when I wondered whether I was really living as a Christian or as a believer or a follower of Jesus Christ, really, truly. A moment or an opportunity presented itself when we were asked uh, to find four or five people who we would take through the Mizizi experience. And I mustered up all my courage and I, and I thought to myself, this is it. There would never be another moment because I was always going to be busy. There was always going to be something else to do. And so I signed up and I did take the, the, the four or five people through the Mizizi experience. And we did start an, a life group that is still alive to today. It was an amazing experience. Recently, I had my Eureka moment when I sat in a room with four people who had been through the Mizizi experience. But that is not what was amazing. What was amazing was I had led Anne through the, the Mizizi experience. She had then led Angela through the Mizizi experience. And Angela had then led James through the Mizizi experience. So there were four generations of people sitting in the room who had actually led others through the Mizizi experience and we were all seated in the room. And as I sat there, I remember thinking, thank God I had had the courage four years ago to actually sign up to become a Mizizi facilitator. That was the best thing I could have ever done. And that changed my life and the alignment of my life forever. So if you're seated at home and you're probably afraid or you've probably outsourced this great responsibility to your pastor or you're too busy, you really don't think you could make the time for to, to lead anyone through the Mizizi experience, I really want to encourage you. This is your opportunity. Look for four, five people. They could be your colleagues at work. They could be your family. They could be people you meet every day. Just muster up the courage. Send them the poster. Call them up and say, listen, let's do this thing together. I want to assure you that not only will it change the lives of everyone, but it will also change your life. You'll never be the same again. So I want to encourage you to go to the link below and you'll get more information. I want to assure you, your life will never be the same again. My name is Pauline Chao, and it's time for you to be the spark. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dennis Rukabu and I lead uh, Mavuno Church Kigali, an amazing community of fearless influences of society. It's an honor and a privilege that I don't, get, get, uh, don't take um, lightly to be able to share uh, the word of God today. So I'm grateful to God and to my leadership, to my leaders, to be so confident in me and say, hey, we want you to share the word of God today. So uh, my message today is entitled, uh, Leading Great. If there's something that I know about our lead pastor, Pastor M, is so passionate about leadership. And that's why we have uh, things like the Fearless Summit. And I hope you enjoy the last, uh, this uh, Fearless Summit uh, 2020. It was amazing. So kudos to the production team. Kudos to all of you that did put 
uh, their strength and their skills in order to make it a memorable experience. So thank you to all of you. So it's all about creating a platform or space for mentorship, you know, for the future uh, leaders. And I really, really learned uh, a lot. So uh, when we talk about leadership, um, this world has given us so many leaders and we know who to follow when we see one. For example, when you grow up, when you're born, of course you're born into a family and your parents are the first leaders that you meet and the way they educate you and the way they teach you and you grow up knowing them as, you know, the people that have led you into being the man who you are, the person that you are today. And a score, of course, in school we have teachers, and teachers have also uh, taught us a lot of things. So we had very many leaders in the course of our lives. And we know the type of leaders that we want to follow, the one that is, is really going to have an impact uh, in our life. So uh, we, today we're going to read in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 32 to 37, and then jump, go to 41 to 45. Uh, when we think about Jesus, we don't think about Jesus as uh, an amazing leader. No, we think about Jesus as uh, a religious figure. And yet Jesus did not really come as a religious figure. Jesus came uh, 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 for, to, to fulfill uh, a vision and a mission that was given by uh, God the Father. So, because uh, when we talk about leadership in terms of uh, uh, church, most of the time it's m more about the past, you know, not the future. And yet we know leadership is about the future. So thinking of Jesus as a religious figure it's not doing him uh, uh, justice at all. Because when we talk about leadership and you follow Jesus' model, it's a model that really cuts across. And I would say this why, I'll say this, if Jesus was not really an influential, uh, someone that uh, was leading people in a way that is amazing, 2,000 years later on, we'll not be talking about him. But today we talk about Jesus because he was an amazing, amazing leader. Now, if you are not Jesus' follower, what we're about to talk about, you know, uh, you, you have the right to choose what you want. And what you don't want, you can let it go. But if you are uh, Jesus' follower, this is one way that Jesus wants us to. To lead. So we are reading from the book of Mark. Mark is one of the gospel writer, and uh, we are told that uh, actually it is known that Mark is no. It was not among the Jesus's uh, apostles, but Mark knew Peter, and uh, we believe that most of his contents came from the conversation or the story that Apostle Peter was telling Mark. So we are reading from the book of Mark uh, 10 to 32, uh, up to 37, and then we jumped 41 to 45. So right now, I just want us to dive in immediately and read uh, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and learn how Jesus uh, led these 12 amazing people. So verse 32 goes like this. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. Now, Jesus is explaining to his disciples saying, hey man, it has been great. We've been popular for all this time. You know, wherever we go to Jerusalem or every city that we'll go to, people receive us an amazing way but now he is telling them that it's a little bit different it's going to be changed right here it's not going to be the amazing reception that we've always had it's 
going to be a little bit south here. So if you are really going to be with me, if you are going to stay with me, then you need to know all of this thing. What is going to happen? So Mark 10, 33 to 34 says, We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now, this is kind of a tender moment. I mean, uh, you know, on their way to Jerusalem, and Jesus is already saying what is going to happen to him, and he calls these uh, people and he tell, his disciples, and he tells them, hey, man, things are going to be a little bit uh, south. You know, it's going to happen, and uh, it, it's not going to be an easy way the way it was before. But now... Uh, as he's talking about being beaten, as he's talking about, you know, being uh, uh, flogged and, uh, and all this uh, harsh stuff that are going to happen to him. And something in between there happens. And if you read 35, then you will see what I'm talking about. Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do whatever we ask. Really? I know I was just pouring my heart. And I'm just trying to think how Jesus was looking at all this thing. I'm trying to pour my heart right here. And I'm trying to tell you what is going to happen. I'm talking about being beaten. I'm talking about people spitting, you know, uh, onto me. I'm talking about, you know, uh, the humiliation that I'm going to go through. And uh, you are asking for a favor. Funny, but it's not really that kind of funny that makes you laugh, but funny in a way that makes you, you, you know, you, pity. <laughs> I, I, I hope you get what I'm, uh, what I'm saying here. So, in that moment, I don't know for you if it has ever happened to you, you know, you are pouring your heart, you are saying what is going to happen to you, and it's really hard, but this person decides to bring a subject that is not really what you're talking about. Just imagine this COVID-19 situation, things are so hard, and maybe you are struggling to pay rent, and you're telling a brother about you know, how your situation has been, and immediately starts talking about Arsenal and Liverpool. Start talking about things that is irrelevant to your situation. So you will feel abandoned. You will feel like nobody cares about you here. And I believe that's where Jesus was in this moment. And all you're caring about right now, you want me to do you a favor? But yes, that's what happened. These two brothers decided to take care of themselves first. They're like, hey man, we want you to do us a favor. And now read this next part and then you tell me, what do you want me to do? That's Jesus asking them. They reply, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other sit on your left hand of glory. You know, we, this is them probably thinking that we can't be like you. We can't be the king. But at least let one of us sit on your left and the other one sit on your right. You know, we just want to be the, the small you. We can't be the king. We can't be the chief. But what we can be is at least, you know, the little you. That, that, and that's what we want. Just like a small you, Jesus. So when you see what was really going, what happening here, they are not concerned about what is going to happen to Jesus, but they are more concerned about their position. Where are we going to be? And I believe so many of us here sometimes, we follow God because of what he's able to do, not of, uh, of the love that we have for him, but we just want him to do something for us. And the same thing that happened right here and right now you can jump into conclusion and start judging this uh, disciples but hey before you judge them look at your life first 
And actually, let us continue and look at what are, about the other apostles. Where were they? So 41, this is what 41 says. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Now, this is what we find out. And I believe for any normal person, when you hear one talking about his situation, and you look at this other that is, it looks like he doesn't care because he cares more about his position. And this third person, I think he should sympathize with this one, saying, hey guys, what are you talking about? This one is talking about being flogged, being beaten, spit on, and all of this thing, and you are talking about position, where you want to be. But that's not how furious they are. They were. They are not furious uh, 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 about uh, how insensitive these people were, but they are furious because they are like, wait a minute, we also want to be on the right hand side, we also want to be on the left hand side. Hey, so within few moments, within few seconds, what Jesus is hearing around him while he's talking about being flogged, being beaten, and all these uh, uh, things that are going to happen to him. There's a group of 12 people arguing who should be on the left-hand side, who should be on the right-hand side of Jesus. But Jesus knew that they are not going to handle it. That's why he replied to them and said, you will not handle to be on my left or on my right-hand side. Even if I'm to say yes, you will not handle. Can you just see Jesus' situation right here? You have people around you, and you are going somewhere with them, and you've been living life with them for three years. So you hope that they know what you are talking about. Before I even proceed, when they were talking about left-hand side and the right-hand side of Jesus, they didn't know that before getting where Jesus was going, he, there was a journey of the cross. And in that journey of the cross, on his right and his left, there are going to be two thieves that are going to be crucified with Jesus. And Jesus knew that James and John are not really up to the task ahead of them. It wasn't their cup of tea. And that's why Jesus was like, hey, you cannot really handle what will happen. So when all of this chaos is happening, when they are uh, trying to find out who should be on the left, who should be on the right, and this is the moment where Jesus spells out them about leadership. He's like, hey, let me tell you about leadership. But we, before we talk about leadership, what do we learn from this journey? What are lessons? I think the first thing we need to understand here is that vision leaks. It's a principle no leader should ever forget. There are three uh, reasons vision speeds away. There are three main reasons that you can say re vision leaks. And one of those things is success. Success can make vision, you know, uh, forget about the main reason why you're doing what you do. Le vision leaks. And another thing is failure. When you are trying and try and try and you fail, sometimes vision leaks because of that. And the third thing is everything in between there. Everything in between there tends to uh, uh, lead to vision leaking. Success means your, your options multiply. Size increase the complexity and complexity can confuse vision. Some of us were more efficient when we were just, you know, like six people, uh, even less, you know, around the table. We all understand what we're talking about. But when we grow, when we become bigger, you know, now communication is actually being distributed in, in, in the way that sometimes you lose some information. And because of that success, we tend to forget about the main reason. We tend to forget about why we do what we do. So, uh, and, and, and what can we do to stop the leakage? If you know that the vision is being leaking, you know, as you go and uh, as you lead your people, but slowly by slowly you know that it's, 
uh, leaking in a way. These are few things that you can do in order to make sure that you always keep people in vision. Of course, the number one thing is repetition. Repeat. None of us cast vision enough. No. Why? Because we think we have already said these things for vision to stick. It, it, has, uh, it has to be cast over and over and over again. Not just over and again, but you have to say it more and more and more. Most of the time, repetition. Remember, practice makes perfect. Ronaldo and Messi, they are where they are because they repeat most of the time. And another thing is watch your timing when you're casting your vision, when you are doing all these things, you have to make sure that you, uh, 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 you look at the timing, not when they're watching the World Cup final, not when uh, the NBA is playing, but make sure you watch the timing, you know. And another thing is, is uh, uh, cast strategically. And when we talk about the vision, it needs to be in a way that's clear and compelling to those who, are, who we are addressing. This component, and, and, and now I will talk about the components that help us uh, keep the vision uh, compelling. But uh, when we talk about timing at Mavuno, we have what we call the staff retreats where you know staff go together and we are in vision one more time and for mavuno kigali we use um, we use the anniversary for us to cast vision one more time so it, it, it makes sense it speaks more to a lot of people you know when you are celebrating six or seven years that you've been uh, you've been there so it, it's an opportunity for you to cast vision one more time so cast strategically it means when you're talking about the vision you need to uh, define the problem. You know, you just don't talk about the vision, but you define the problem. Look at the problem. And after you have uh, uh, mentioned the problem, and of course in our society when there's a certain problem, sometimes it's really obvious to all of us. So now offer a solution. So if you offer a solution, then people will be compelled to the vision. So, but do not just stop there, but present an urgent reason. Why should we do this now? Why is it a must for us to do this? And immediately, it, that is some of the way, some of the things that will compel people to say, hey, we need to do this. And I believe that's what Jesus did when, before reaching Jerusalem, he's like, you know what? Let's stop. He called for a halt and say, stop. Let us go this, over this one more time. And I believe it was not an easy thing for Jesus. I believe it was not an easy thing for Jesus. So let us read uh, Mark 10, uh, 42. And then you're going to understand what Jesus said to them. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, Lord over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. I'll read it one more time. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, Lord it over them. And their higher officials exercise authority over them. He's saying, you know how leadership works. You know, if you are the leader, then you lord it over those that are under you. When you are the one in authority, then you leverage your authority for what it is best for you. It's all about you. And I believe the disciples were like, hey, that's the main reason. That's why we want to lead. That's why we want to be the bosses, because we don't want to be lorded over, but we want to lord over to others. That's the main thing. And I hope, Jesus, you understand this thing. You know, we want to be the king. We want to be the main people here. But as Jesus is explaining to them, and he's telling them, you know how leadership works in the world. You know how people 
take advantage of those that they are under them. You know how uh, people, instead of sacrifice the, sacrificing themselves for the people that they lead, but they actually sacrifice the people so that then they can be uh, somewhere. So, and in that moment, that is when now Jesus gives them what leadership is all about. So if you read in Mark 10, 43 to 44, you'll hear Jesus saying, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. In other words, you know how people say, uh, uh, how, how leadership works, but not so with you. You have seen authority operate in the Roman Empire, but not so with you. It's not so with you. Jesus turned this thing completely upside down. And he says, if you are going to follow me, and you are going to claim to be one of my followers, then you have to lead like I lead. And here is how I expect you to lead. Instead of saying, wash my feet, you wash their feet. The contrast of dominion and authority is to that of ministers and servants. Note that the letter, the letter are also part of a person's identity. You can't be dominion, but you can be minister. You can't be authority, but you can be servant. Being great in God's kingdom, it, it, it requires that, uh, we, that the characteristics of a servant comes first. That's what should be inside you. A great leader is characterized by service. And it's something that is so, is so needed in the identity of kingdom leadership. As James chapter 4, 10 states, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. This model of leadership is such a paradigm shift from what we normally think. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, God using the foolishness of the world to confound the wise. You understand that? And yet, we, the current disciples of God, sometimes we also miss the boat. So you should not jump into conclusion and judging those disciples. No, sometimes we miss this and we think that being a leader, it's all about us. It's not about us. Jim Collins, in his book, uh, Good to Great, he highlights or profile what he calls the level five leader. The level five leader was his description of what a great business uh, 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 um, man or a leader in all these sectors of society should, should look like. And as he was doing his research and how he was looking at trying to see what makes a great leader great and as he was going around in his mind he already had an assumption and his assumption was that behind all these great companies with great leaders they must be a great leader with this type of character in his mind his uh, 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 opinion, he was thinking that w one of the traits that is going to see in this great leader was charisma. In his mind, as he was doing his research, running up and down, he's doing research about great leadership, one of the traits that proves or shows or makes you a great leader. In his mind, he already had an assumption. He had already his own opinion. Right now, all of you do have, you have your own opinion already as I'm speaking right now that what should be 
the characteristic of this great leader. You already have it. He did the same thing. But his research proved him wrong. He found that all these great leaders, what they had in common was not charisma, but humility. Humility is what he found as one of the greatest things that all these leaders had in common. I know that some of you think and say, hey, you know what, Dennis, this cannot work. This can work in a church environment. Don't expect us to apply this in our workplace. Maybe a church, but not you know, in the corporate world. To tell you the truth is that for those who have been at church, I'm so sure you feel me and you understand. Church is not really an easy place, by the way. And I always say this, and forgive me, uh, church folks, you know, uh, in the corporate world, I've been in the corporates, I've been a manager, uh, one of uh, the, f among the five-star hotel here in Kigali. I know that in the corporate world, when someone doesn't like you, they will show you that they don't like you. <laughs> they will tell you. So even if you want to go to their department and ask for something, you know how you're going to take yourself there. Leave that alone. But at church, people tend to, you know, cover it a little bit. It's all about amen and hallelujah. But really, their heart is not there. So leading a church, I don't think it's something that is really simple. But this is the main thing here. Leaders. And that's why I say that we have, the world has given us very many leaders in the world. But this one cuts across. Yes, indeed, being a church, being in the corporate, if you are a leader and this trait is not in you, the trait of humility, then there is an issue here. And this is what Jesus was telling them. It's telling them that if you want to lead like I lead, instead of loading over to others, we need to learn how to serve. Jesus' leadership model was not to lord things over other people, but actually to learn how to serve them. So, what Jesus is not saying here is for you to stand on the door every morning and just say, you first, you first, you first. That's not what he's saying. He's, Jesus is not against a point leadership. No. He was a leader himself. And even when he left, he pointed some leaders. He's not against that. And that is not what we're talking about here. But we are talking about leading through service. And sometimes it's something very simple and so small. Just like, what, what can I do to help? Just that. Very simple. What can I do to help? So if you read Mark 10, 45, you see what Jesus is saying here. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If there's someone who had all the rights <laughs> to claim for a good castle, to have good shapes around him and servant all around him, it was Jesus Christ. But he never did that. He said actually, he came to serve. And ladies and gentlemen, I know it is easier said than done. I know. Even me as a leader, as a pastor, Vuno Church Kigali, I'm learning how to serve. Note, because it is so easy to say, we want to go here and I want you, 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 you to do A, B, C, D. It is so easy. But what does not come easily is to go and tell them, this thing that you're supposed to do, how can I help? Is any, there any help that you need? And I know you also need help. How can I make it easy for you? It's not an easy thing that comes from a leader. And I know, because the world has taught us other ways of leading. And it's tricky, and we've seen that it doesn't really work. Because 
These type of leaders that sacrifice their people so that they can reign forever, they are not the type of leaders that we are looking in this new era, in this world that God has given us and say, I give you dominion. But what he was talking about while he gave us the dominion, he was telling us, go and work and serve. So this is what great leaders do. So what will this look like in your world? And what could you do to begin tomorrow? And perhaps by God's grace, we could be the generation, the generation. Even if it's just in a, a small community, but you start this thing. And probably people will view Christians in a different way. And probably people will see leadership in a different way. Even if it's just like a small way. Even if it's just a small thing that you are going to start. Start from there. And I believe God will bless you and your community. So, ladies and gentlemen, I believe I'm at the end of uh, my message. But if there's something, the main thing that you should get from this message is learn how not to lord over. But learn how to tell your people, how can I help? If I can just give you a small story. Like I said, I worked in the corporate before and I was a manager at one of the five-star hotels here in Rwanda, uh, Kigali, precisely. And there's a day we were so busy. You know, hotels sometimes, you know, it's a peak. It's a high season and it's so crazy. And it was breakfast time at the restaurants, you know, where our, our, our <clears throat> clients are having breakfast. And, you know, as a manager, you, you, you're moving around. Uh, you're managing by walking around. <laughs> and then <clears throat> I saw some stuff that are not really good. And it was not supposed to stay on the table for that long. It doesn't really look good. And I, I'm among those people that sometimes really want to see a table that looks neat. So immediately, instead of telling people, hey, go and take those things off, I decided to go and pick them by myself. And by the time I was doing that, there were like three or two other waiters coming, running, and saying, oh, no, let us do this. But you could see in their face how happy they were to see that, you know, yeah, he's with us, and we are doing this work together. It's not like, uh, you know, you go and pick that up. No. He can see that we are busy, he can see that, you know, things are a little bit crazy in this situation. And he decides to roll up his sleeves and go and pick those plates and those cutleries. So the message that they got from that gesture, it's something way beyond than giving them money. So I believe for so many of you that are leaders out there, learn how not to lord over, but learn to go and say how can I help? So ladies and gentlemen, if you can just get this part of the message and go outside there and apply them, because that's the main thing. Most of the time, what do we do when we go to church? We learn, we take a lot of information, but we don't apply them. By the time you don't apply anything that you've learned, you are going to forget that thing instantly. But when you apply what you have learned, it becomes part of you. It becomes you. And when people look at you, they say, that is someone that has changed. That is someone that has been transformed by the word of God. So ladies and gentlemen, go through the book of Mark 10, 32 to 37. And you can read it all, actually. Just read the book of Mark and try to understand Jesus' way of leading. If you are really Jesus' disciple, Jesus' follower, this is how you should lead. Not how to lord over, but how to serve the people that you are leading. Allow me just to say a short prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we bless you. In the name of Jesus, we honor you today. And we thank you for the things that you have done. We honor and we elevate your name in this place. Father, what we have learned, we pray that it has landed in the heart that is ready to receive the word of God. And Lord, the seed of the word of God will bear fruit. And your people and the world will see that we are your children. 
from today onward, Father Lord, let the Holy Spirit teach us how to apply the words that we, the, your word, Father Lord, the word that you have just put in us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we honor you. We believe in your power. We believe in your grace. We believe in your anointing. And Lord, we pray that right now, anyone that is following, anyone that has received this message, Father Lord, you will lift them up in their leadership. I thank you and I honor you in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next Sunday. Wow, thank you so much, Pastor Dennis. What a powerful word. And, and this month we've been going through a whole series called Unstuck. And my prayer is that this is unstucking us all in our faith. Now you heard uh, Pastor Angie earlier, I just want to urge every single one of us, uh, this is a season of change, this is a season to try new things, this is a season to just take God at his word and step out in faith. My prayer is that none of us will be left stuck where we used to be, but this is a season for us to do the things we never could have done because God is at work in this season. So hey, let me just encourage you, if you are in a space where you need uh, to do this experience, please make sure you sign up. Uh, use the link on the screen if you are the place where you feel I can take somebody through this it could be my children that I can even walk through this it could be some neighboring children it could be my colleagues at work it could be some friends that I've been meeting with it could be my alumni group that I'm a part of it could just be even friends across the world the power of, of doing this virtually is anyone can participate so be in prayer about it invite some friends and let's walk through this journey together this is a year of influence that's the thing I've come to understand God really wants us to be about spreading his influence even in this season and then the last thing i'll just say is thank you for your generosity uh you are such a generous congregation i know i say this every week and i don't say it because i have to i say it because my heart is overflowing with gener with, with thanksgiving for your generosity and i just want to encourage you uh in your giving as you give to the work of the lord may the lord refresh you as well if you are new at this uh we use the information on our screen there's an mpsa number there it's 508 700 you can indicate the compass you want to give to or just give tithes and offerings if you want to give it generally that way you can indicate if you're a guest giving from somewhere else and uh just want to support this work and our prayer is that god will just completely replenish every time you give to his work that god would replenish and refill uh, where it came from so god bless you and come on let's just walk this journey of being unstuck. Let's be the spark. Was the